For tapes, CDs, DVDs, or our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, for Jesus has set me free. Uh, that came from, from Worldless Church years ago. We were had been there, and he has been in our church and brought the songs, and that's one of Worldly songs. And Brother Buzz, I saw it on his overhead projector slide the other night, didn't even recognize him. He's been in my church. His wife back there was a member of my church before she met Buzz. Praise the Lord. And I ran into Phyllis this morning, and I, I had sing. good conversation. I want to sing. I want to sing. You want to sing. Out okay. you go to Taurus. You've been there too long. Filled with deception, you must deceive. And all your curses we will not receive. So out you go to Taurus. Your work has all been in vain. For it's one, two, we cast you out in Jesus' name. Taurus is a horrible place, filled with shame and disgrace. You'll never see another face. Taurus is a horrible place, you're gonna go there. We sing the demons too, you know. We're a deliverance church. Most of you know that we are a deliverance church. We're from Millington, Tennessee. We have a very small congregation. We still fight demons at least twice a week at night. On Sunday night and Wednesday night, we have services. And Sunday morning, we usually uh, get into the Word and share the Word. And occasionally, we do the Word on Sunday morning, like last Sunday morning. The lady came in and said, My side hurts. I feel bad. Well, you pray for me. And Mildred said, Come out of her. And all hell broke loose. And we cast hell out of her. Amen. Cast a lot of demons out of her. And, the, and, and that was the service. I mean, it took long enough for to go through the service. We usually spend about two hours in the morning on church. And at night, I've seen it start at uh, 6 o'clock. And at 5 o'clock the next morning, it was still going because we were ministering to people. We haven't done that lately, but it has been that way in our church. And when you have needs, when people have needs, you don't turn your back and walk away. You know what he said? We was too old to go that long. I told him, no, not yet. <laughs> he, he, did. Said, he, he, he said, did. He said, he told me, you told me not too not long yet. ago. He One said, more. honey, we're too old to go for 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I said, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. One, one of these days, I'm going to get old, but not yet. It is. You're right. Without the anointing, and it, it takes it takes an anointing, and it takes uh, discernment. It takes discerning of spirits uh, to to walk in this ministry. People say they want a good ministry. They want a, a, a real good ministry. Hey, deliverance is the best ministry I know of. You can see God move. You can see God move in, deliver, in deliverance, whereas. Uh, in a lot of other ministries, you, you by faith walk in them. Sometimes in healing, you're in many times in healing. But you know, Mildred spoke the other day and, and said this, if some of you weren't here, she said, no, I asked the Lord for a nice, clean ministry like healing. And He told her, I gave it to you in deliverance. And when you read the Word and when you get in the Word and you start discerning God's Word, you will learn that, that this is true, that... Uh, much of our illnesses, most all of our illnesses, is caused by, caused by demons. And when you cast demons out, you see people get healed, and you pray for their for the damage they've, that's been done in people. Then you really see a healing done. So uh, we walk in a, a unique ministry. People sometimes come against it because it sounds negative. You talk about the devil. 
We should talk about the Lord and lift the Lord up. When I put the devil under my feet, I have lifted the Lord up. And this is what we're doing. We're not giving him any glory at all. But, you know, too long the church has, has hid the devil in the back room somewhere and has not uh, openly told its people about hell and, and Satan and what his power is and what he's doing. And as Mildred said, there's a church on every corner where I live there is. You know, when I came to Memphis, Tennessee, there was more churches than there were filling stations. That's true. I mean, that's in there, was in there, in there, on their map of the city. There's more churches in this town than there are filling stations. And, and they, they are preaching, I don't know what they're preaching now, but there's a lot of watered down word going forth this day and time. And we try never to preach anything that we cannot back up. Right here. Here, here is where, where we work from. This, this is our authority. And this is what we use. Are you ready for me to start and tell us the testimony? I'm on. Our oh, well, good. Praise the Lord. I'm killing time. I'm not killing time. God's time is precious. You know, at, at an early age, about two months before I was 12 years old, one afternoon, I uh, came in from school and was very anxious to go back the next day because there was a carnival at school. And uh, I got up on, on the next morning. It was a Friday, and I got up on Friday morning. There was a carnival. It was a Halloween carnival. That's what it was in the school. And I couldn't walk. And uh, I wasn't able to walk at all. My ankle was hurting me. And it was I had thought well, I sprained my ankle. I had a pet rabbit that I jumped over the fence trying to catch. And I probably sprained the ankle the day before, and it just showed up. Uh, the next day, I, I still couldn't walk. They started calling the doctor early in the morning, and by noon, afternoon, by 1 o'clock, he finally was able to come to the house. That's unique. Doctors don't come to the house anymore. After a few questions and looking at my foot and how tender it was, uh, he sat down across from me and he said, This boy is seriously ill. He's not going to be well in a day or two, maybe not a year or two. He might never be well again. I want him in the hospital right now. My father was at work. He was a contractor, and my mother got old on the phone and found him, and they rushed me to the hospital and cut a hole in my leg and bored a hole in the bone, and the corruption hit the wall from the operating table with so much pressure in it, and it was eating up the marrow of the bone. It's called osteomyelitis. And they wanted, after three weeks, it was still spreading, it wasn't wasn't relieved. They took six inches of bone, the top half off my off of the main bone, and it was still spreading, draining a teacup full a day, and still spreading up the bone. They wanted to take the knee off after three weeks, or take the leg off at the knee, but they also wanted permission to take it off at the thigh. My father, I have learned since I have become adult that my father was a lay preacher. Didn't know that when I was growing up. But uh, he said, no, you're not going to do it. You're not going to take his leg off. He said, he'll die if you don't. What are you going to do? He says, I don't know, but you're not going to do that. Eventually, he found somebody came to him, and they got me in a Shriners Hospital in Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, they put me in a cast, cleaned out that hole and put me in a cast. I stayed actually in a cast for a year. Not the same one, but I stayed a year in a cast for my... As, top, uh, as high on my thigh as they could get it to the tip of my toes with a bar on it so I couldn't even turn my leg. Had a big hole cut in the cast so they could dress the, the wound, the opening, every day. Uh, I learned to walk again on a pair of crutches. During that time, my leg did not grow. It was ended up an inch and a half short. That's the preliminary part. That's what happened to me. When I was 45 years old, a, a spirit-filled man said... Uh, I want you to go to a meeting with me. It's different. I heard tongues for the first time, and I was in a Baptist church, and we'd been told that those were ignorant, unlearned people who spoke in tongues, and uh, they were not real, and they were of the devil. And I heard tongues from some woman behind me in a little place called the Upper Room in Tyronza, Arkansas. But across the aisle from me, a man said, Thus saith the Lord. And he gave an interpretation of what she said. And it ministered to me. But when after the meeting I met that man, and he was a medical doctor, which blew all my theology about speaking in tongues and unlearned people. And a few weeks later, this same person carried me to a full gospel meeting 
Baptist preacher from down in Texas who was holding me, whose church was in a in a, a, a former uh, bowling alley, I believe was what it was. Had one of the biggest church, growing church, fastest growing churches in, in Dallas, I believe, is where it was from. Uh, but anyhow, uh, at the end of the service, he gave an invitation to receive the baptism. And uh, I sat there like a stump on a log, uh, or not on a log. And uh, my wife elbowed me real hard and said, don't you want to go? And I didn't know she had received the baptism several weeks before from the wife of this man that I was with. She didn't dare tell me. I was Baptist through and through. I was a deacon in the Baptist church. And she hadn't told me about that. And I said, yes, I do. And I got up and I went. And I went in to knock on the door that the room that they'd went in. And there were people lining the walls all the way around that room with standing against the wall and a man standing in front of them ministering to them. And a man came to the door and said, uh, yes, what can I do for you? And it was a little... Short, fairly short man, gray hair, gray suit, gray mustache. I remember this very clearly. He became a real close friend of mine later, but that was how he was dressed, and that's what he looked like. And I said, I came to receive the baptism. He said, come in. And there was not a chair in the place. We were in a, in a there were dining tables there. We were in, a, uh, in the dining hall of a college. And he stood me up against the wall, and he started praying for me, and I could not speak in tongues. I could say all kinds of things, but I could not speak in tongues. And finally, I told him, I said, Brother, I believe in this very thoroughly, but I've got to sit down. My leg is just about to kill me. And that tells you where I was walking when I said it's about to kill me. But that's what I said. And he said, uh, what's the matter? I said, I have rheumatism in my knee and in the bottom of my foot from an old operation. He said, let me get your chair. And he ran, got a chair, and he put it in there, an old straight chair, a straight chair, oak straight chair that went with these oak table dining tables. And I sat down, and he said, let me pray for it. And he reached down, and he grabbed my ankles. And you saw Brother Bill do this, Pick, take the people by the ankle and pray for them. And when he did, he said, there's something wrong with this leg. And I didn't know what he was talking about. He, I told him I had rheumatism. But what happened was he had his hand in the old scar where they'd cut six inches long and a hole three inches, almost three inches wide out of my leg. And it was a big hole down in there. And that's what he was feeling. And I didn't know that, though. And I said, well, I'd already told him it was had room. To, I said, it's an inch and a half shorter than the other. And he just turned and said, I praise you, Jesus, for lengthening his leg. I thought he stuck his finger in that 110 volt socket over there. And he didn't touch anything. It came through his hand. It came up my leg and up my left side to the top of my head. And when, I, when it did, I said, what was that? And he said, did you feel that? All at one instant, just like that. And my hair stood straight up. And I'm not kidding. Right? Right. It stayed there, too. It stayed straight up. For a period of time, I came out with my hair still standing straight up. But I got up and I couldn't walk. My leg had been an inch and a half shorter from the time I was 13, 14 years old until I was 45 years old. And I was used to walking like that. And when I tried to walk across the floor, it hit the floor long before it was supposed to. And I stumbled around for quite a while until I learned how to handle that new leg. Now, I tell you this not to say that I'm a special person. God, God had, a, had a use for me, and God was showing His ability and His love to me so that I could go on and do a, be a vessel that He could move through. And I don't tell this very often. I've done it here before. Glenn asked me to do this once before to tell this because I had told him. And so I, I was impressed to tell it today because we want to do the other. But I, I don't want you to think that this was for me, but it was for my Lord that he did this. And he led me to this young lady over here 52 years ago, and we decided we were going to get married, and we've been married for 52 years. And 18 years ago, we were called into the ministry. We had already been ordained, and we were called into the ministry uh, by a church that called us. And we've been ministering the same church. Well, it'll be 18 years. It's the first of the year. It's 17 years that we've been doing this. So this is where we come from. This is who we are. And God's still on His throne. Don't you think He didn't get my attention? He turned me around that day. I came out and there were a group of people from the church that I was in. And uh, 
They all saw that hair stand on him that night. And a little later, the church graciously requested that I leave them because they didn't like people that spoke in tongues. Praise the Lord. Come, Mildred, and share what you have with them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, you should have, you should have seen him. He saw his hair standing on edge, on ends. His eyes was bugged out. I'm telling you, he was so startled. It was really amazing to, to everyone that saw him. Half of the church, some of the church, I don't know how many Baptist people were there. They had gone to hear this. This was the Baptist preacher that we all went to hear. He had uh, been raised from the dead, literally. And so, of course, that was okay to go, you know, go. So it was real interesting. But praise the Lord that the Lord has been moving and dealing with us, and he's not through yet. And I keep saying, don't give up on me. He's not through with me yet. It wants to go down. <laughs> praise the Lord. I had uh, kind of wanted to share a little bit on the sins of the mothers, but I won't do that today. We've been talking about the sins of the fathers. But he was wanting me to go ahead and do this on the uh, soul. So I'm going to share on the soul. How many of you have heard about, the, you know about soul ties, right? Well, I've preached this, a lot of this uh, before. And so I just want to share a little bit this afternoon on the fragmented soul, the soul being removed. And the first time I ever heard about this, I was in Wynn Hurley's church in Chicago, and uh, Dr. Haggard, Marcus Haggard, was teaching that afternoon. And I was still real Baptist, too. I, I, I wasn't as Baptist as Jim, but he was, I was Baptist. And, uh, you know, women don't preach. And um, I, keep, I, I really had a real hard time with the Lord about this business of preaching. I'll tell you all this. Uh, I begged the Lord not to, for me not to do it, to give it to Jim. He said, he'll, he'll, he'll walk in the door and I'll call him in and you'll do what I told you to or you'll stand and give account for not, not uh, obeying me. So we were sitting in that church. Of course, I, Brother Worley didn't, wasn't real fond of women either, especially women preachers. I'm not a preacher. I'm just... Sharing, I share the word. I don't call myself a preacher. When anybody asks who's the pastor of our church, I always say he is. Because he is. He's the authority in our church. But anyways, I heard Dr. Haggard talk about the soul being having soul ties. And I'm telling you, I thought, this is the first time I'd ever gone there. And I thought, what have I walked into? So I got up and went downstairs to the bathroom and I was in there and I thought Lord I've never heard anything like this before the, we, the, you know, I've been taught that when you get saved your soul is saved I mean but to have soul ties and, I don't know about that and, and you know the, the Spirit of the Lord just really talked to me about you know you can be ignorant if you want to just stay out here and stay down here and hide <laughs> that's literally but, but, but you know I was so hungry to know. I want to know. I want. I want all that's in this. I want to know everything. I haven't. I don't know anything about this book yet. I'm just learning. But I wanted to know, so I went back upstairs and I said, "Okay, Lord, you brought me here, so here I am." And I sat there, and then, you know, he, when he began to explain it uh, what, on the soul ties, it really began to make sense because he was giving me scripture for everything he said. So, if you will, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter one. Jim, come pray. Did you bind spirits? Yep. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind every spirit in this place. Praise you, Jesus. I put you under my feet Thank according you. to the Word of God. I have authority Thank over you. It is given to me. Jesus said that we could walk on serpents Praise and scorpions, and they would not harm us, and that, that He had given us all power over the enemy. So I take that authority today in the name of Jesus, and I put you under my feet, and I command you to be gone from this place. You will be silent if you stay in Jesus' name. You will not harass, nor will you uh, attack this pulpit. 
during this service in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I bind you off of this pulpit and the one that speaks in Jesus' name, and I bind you and the people that are here in the name of the Lord Jesus Praise. Christ. I Praise. take authority over you, and you'll not have dominion or rule in this place in the name of the Lord Jesus. I praise you, Father, and I thank you for that authority in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. In Genesis, in chapter 1, when God created man, he said, I must be sure I use the right scriptures. I've been uh, battling the enemy ever since all afternoon, so I must be, we must be doing what the Lord really wants us to do this afternoon. In Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26, and the verse says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God said, let us make man in our image and, let, and I'm, going to give him, I'm giving him dominion. And what, over in uh, John's Gospel in chapter 6, verse 24, I mean 424, John chapter 424, 24th verse, says God is a spirit. So God made us spirit beings and he put us in a body. And then he said in verse, verse 20, 27, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he, him. Male and female created he them. And God saw, verse 31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the first day. When God created man, he said it was, and woman, he said it was very good. And over in Genesis 2, chapter 2, verse Seven, he said, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You know, I was reading this, I was doing a study on this just recently, and uh, I got over into John's Gospel. Here we see that the Lord breathed into, the, into man. He made him in his image. And I said, God is a spirit. John 4.24 says, God is a spirit. So he made man a spirit, and then he form man uh, body out of the dust of the ground and there he lay until he breathed the breath of life into him and I was I was reading this and the Lord sent me I, I'm I'm going to show you something that we do, did not come alive man did not come alive until God breathed into him and you know the same thing happened with you and I when we were born again God was showing me this in John's Gospel, in John chapter 20 and verse 22. Jesus, after he came back out of the tomb, he breathed upon the disciples. He said, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. God breathed in that, on Adam in Genesis and Jesus breathed on, on the disciples in John. John 20, when he came back from the, from the tomb. So you and I, we're, not, we're spiritually dead until we receive the Holy Spirit, until we were born again, until the Spirit of God came within us. And God created us in his image. And he wanted us to love him with all of our being, did he not? He wants us to be, to walk in the Spirit realm as as we walk in the Spirit, and as uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 14 tells us, that unless we do, we can't receive the things of God. You're not going to receive the things of God with your carnal mind. Brother Tommy talked about that this morning. He said in, in um, verse, let me see what verse that is, 14, he said, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, but for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Here, here, right, see. So, in the natural, we cannot receive from the things of the Spirit of God. We've got to receive by the Spirit. And we, our problem is we try to receive everything by our minds. And until we begin to receive in our spirit, you know, you know, the reason the devil wants your soul is because you receive the things in your spirit, but you don't understand them until you receive, they work, you get them up through your mind. Because I was, I was talking to our church one time and I said, you know, God ministers to us by the spirit, 
but we understand it through our soul. God is spirit, and you're spirit, and spirit to spirit. My husband and I pray together sometime. I'll walk up to him and just talk in tongues to him. And he talks back to me, or he'll do that to me. But my mind doesn't understand what he's saying to my spirit until the spirit of the Lord brings it up into my mind, and I understand what he's saying. And so what I wanted to show you by using these scriptures this afternoon is to show you that without your soul, all of your soul, there's no way you or I can understand the word of God. Are you with me? And we understand it through our mind. So the enemy wants the soul. You know, uh, I, I used a scripture over in Romans 8, verse 11. It says, But if, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. See, we want the spirit. The, spirit, the word says the spirit man is renewed day by day, right? It is. And so what we wanted to do is to quicken the mortal flesh. We don't want that. We don't want that. Uh, you know, the minute you're born into the earth, you, you you begin to die. And what we want to do is to walk in the kingdom and walk in the life. And when we become the spirit man that God wants us to be, when we begin to know by the spirit the things God wants us to know, I believe it'll, it, as the scripture says, it's the same spirit that came into you and to I that raised Jesus from the dead. I know the power of God was there, but you see, the Holy Spirit is God, the power of God, is He not? And He lives within you and I, and so He wants to bring us alive to God, spirit, soul, and body. Because if I'm not mistaken, uh, over in First Thessalonians uh, chapter five, verse twenty-three, Paul said that you may be uh, preserved, blameless, spirit, soul, and body. See, we just think, well, the body's going, and the body is supposed to go back to dust if we don't live till Jesus comes. And I'm saying, I'm, I'll be seventy this 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 year, so I'm planning on living till Jesus comes. I don't care what the devil says. He tells me all the time, you're going to die. Well, I've heard that before. I asked him he don't have anything new to say. But anyways, praise the Lord. But what we've got to do is to start believing this word. And, and you know, I teach this in my church all the time. Jim and I both do. And we try to get them people to work at calling their soul back. And that you know what? The devil didn't take your soul all at one time. And you said, well, I got my soul. Are you walking in that? Authority that I read to you in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Are you taking dominion? God said, I give you dominion over the fish, over the birds, over everything, over the weather. You know, if, if the devil is, and I know, I know the Lord does, the Lord's in control. But a lot of times, uh, do you really think that God is blowing away whole, king, whole cities and killing people in that area? We have authority. Jesus, if you don't believe it, read your Bible. Jesus walked a walk to show us how to walk. Did he not? Well, he spoke to the storm and he says, peace, be still. You said, but that was Jesus. I'm created in the image of God. So are you. God says, I've given you authority. He said, over in Genesis 1. So what I'm saying is, that if you've got all your soul, you're supposed to be walking in the same walk that Jesus walked. Well, I, I may not have all my soul. I've been praying a long time. Ever since I learned about it, I've been praying. To, well, I didn't learn at that time that I didn't have all of it. I just learned about soul ties. But I've been breaking soul ties ever since I learned about that. And then when I learned that the, the soul could be fragmented and removed, then I've been ever, especially if I have time with trouble remembering something, I'll say, Lord, I need that part of my soul brought back. You know, the world says when you get my age, that you're getting old and you're supposed to not remember. But my Bible says I've got the mind of Christ. And he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And if the Bible says it, then it's mine and I'm going to have it. And so if the enemy's got a part of my soul, removed a part of it when I didn't know about this, I'll give you scripture for what I'm saying. Then I want it back. And God said he'd restore it. But he doesn't, you know, God doesn't ever do anything just because we presume he will. He walks, he moves by faith. He said, Jesus said, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? And so we, we get to the point where we say, well, I, I don't believe that or I know that or whatever. What we need to say is, God, teach me, show me. So if he says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me, that's a lot of power. 
And it's just sitting there most of the time, not doing anything. Because we really don't believe. I heard Irma say one time that, and I know some of you women have heard this, that she was at a meeting one time and, and a woman manifested it. She was at a book table and a woman manifested and she had to cast the spirit out of her. And, and it was the spirit of unbelief. And it said, I kill the Christians. You think about that. Unbelief kills the Christians. Ezekiel 32, 36, excuse me, verse 25. Let's go there for a minute. Y'all thought I was going to Ezekiel 13. I am eventually. (laughs) Ezekiel 36, in verse 25, it says, Then will I sprinkle clean, clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and you shall keep my judgments and, and do them. And, I was, and when I read this, God said in his word he would put a new heart and a new spirit within us. And so when we were born again, we received that new spirit. The spirit of God comes within and, and brings life to us. And he says a new heart, the heart is, is part of the soul. When you look that up, it, it all goes to the soul and the and heart are all the same word in the, in the concordance. But God wants us to receive all that he's given unto us. And, and, to, and to me, what he's saying here is, let's start, uh, when you're born again, take the word and begin to believe it as a new book, and not by doctrines by, that you've been taught, but by what the Spirit of the Lord is trying to reveal to you. And so what I'm, what I'm wanting to say to you now is, in the area of, um, of the soul being removed, that if you um, have children that you're having trouble with, getting them saved and everything, you need to call their soul back. Psalms 23, you know the scripture, God said in his word, he restoreth my soul. Why did he say that if we had all of our soul? Well, I, we don't want to think we haven't got all of our soul. Do you? It's like I shared another night, other day on that false prophet that talks to us all the time. We don't want to believe that things inside of us talking to us. But... When I saw this and when I began to see, I, I told you, told some of you, I think, I don't know how many of y'all were here the other day when I said the way that I learned about the soul being removed was through a spirit when I was ministering deliverance. And the thing told me that the girl didn't have all her soul was the reason we had such a hard time getting her to believe the word. So many people go up to be saved over and over and over again. Do they not? Over in uh, Psalms. Verse 7. Let's look at it. 7. Verse 2. Let's start verse 1. O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces, while there is none to deliver. The scripture says, in First Peter, that the enemy goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And here we see that David is saying that the enemy would tear the soul when there was no one to deliver. Before you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, you had no protection over your soul. You had no protection at all. And you belonged to the enemy. And then... He could remove any part of it he wanted to. And he goes on to say, O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hand, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is my enemy. Let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay my honor in the dust. So before you came to know Jesus, you had... The enemy had all every perfect right to take the soul. This girl that I was talking about was hearing voices, and she came into our church. That she'd been to doctors, she'd been to, uh, taking all kinds of therapy, she'd taken all kinds of medication, done all these things, and, and she was just it was she was literally thought, thought she was losing her mind, and. We started working on her. We just started doing deliverance like we normally did with everyone else. But we did not know she didn't have a soul, all of her soul. And then one day, as I shared, we found out that she didn't have her soul. And that demon told me that her soul was not there until she came into our church. And we had, through breaking soul ties, she'd been married and she'd had an abortion. She had, had, 
all the bad things that you can think of that happened to her. She, she had never been on drugs, per se, except what the doctors had prescribed. And yet, she could not get any peace. She had no peace. When she came to our church, she literally would not go to the bathroom unless her mother went with her. And she, she was 32 years old. And she had moved back home and was sleeping in the bed with her mother. She was so full of fear. And as we prayed for and ministered to her, we found that her soul had been removed. And when I heard that, I thought, this is, this is not real. I don't believe that. I didn't tell her that. I didn't tell the demon that. Because I, I always listen to see what they say. And I said later to the Lord, I said, Lord, you show me. You show me if this is real. Go to Ezekiel 13. And I had taught many times from Ezekiel 13 on witchcraft. But in Ezekiel 13, in verse 18, if you read the first part of this, it's talking about false prophets and how people are, are deceived by false prophets. And, and listen to them. And then it goes on and, and it's about the witch, witchcraft and all this. In verse 18, it tells us about it. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sow pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs on the head of every statue to hunt souls. Did you ever, see, ever read that and see that it said it, they hunt souls? We know which, in witchcraft they do this, that they, call, they remove people's, parts of people's souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people, and will you save the souls alive that come unto you, and will you, be pol- will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die, and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies? Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillars, wherefore ye hunt that ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. Through witchcraft, we they practice this, and we don't know, we don't know anything about it other than we I had a we had a witch come to our church one time. But right here in the scripture, it talks about that there is a spirit that hunts souls to make them fly. And as we went over into, um, uh, you can go over to. Uh, um, Genesis, I think it's the 11th chapter, and it talks about Nimrod being a mighty hunter before the Lord. Do a study on it sometimes and find out what it says about him. I was sharing this one night here, and there was a minister here, and he, he got up and told me later. I said at that time I, I wasn't sure who the hunter soul was. Well, you know, if he had a name, I'm just calling the hunter souls. That he hunts people's souls. And he said, you know, that was Nimrod. And so I, I did a study on it, and so... Anyways, but I wanted to show you that the soul can be fragmented and be be removed. Um, this scripture, as you read the rest of this, talks about people that die that should live and those that live that should die. You ever see people that love the Lord, walk with the Lord, taught Sunday school, preach, did everything, and end up in a nursing home? And out of them will come the most ungodly things. They, they become uh, hard to deal with and hard to handle. And they're, they're, they've not known that this, about the soul has never been taught in the churches. Because we, you know, we think we've, we're okay. But if we were, if we were who, if we had all of our mind, will, and emotion, just, we, we believe the soul is the mind, will, and emotion. And what's the other, Tommy? Desires. So all of what we are is here in, in our soulish area. And the, so the enemy wants that. So you see, he doesn't, can't touch your spirit uh, because it's sealed with the Holy Spirit, but he can remove the soul. So you can't be what God has called you to be and that you can't, can't comprehend what God is trying to show you. The biggest thing he wants you to do is to separate you from God. And he kills people. The enemy kills people through this, removing their soul, where they cannot believe that should live. He'll keep one alive that can drain the life out of the family and be torment that individual. And I know what I'm telling you about. I have a sister that's in the nursing home. And I go, go to, would go to visit her. And I hear demons all over that place. You can hear them. 
And here are people that some of them are, are godly people. Some of them may have never known the Lord. I don't know. But there are some that are godly people that are being tormented by those spirits. They're being, they see them. They, and, but why? Because this word says right here, their soul has been removed. And the enemy keeps them alive and uses them to torment them and to destroy the family, to drain the money from people's pockets and, and, and to literally, well, did you ever see, there's not too many families that to have someone in a nursing home that they're done that one time caused strife and separation in the family because everybody's so busy you know we've got their own lives and yet we've got to take care of mother or we've got to take care of aunt Susie or whatever and this is a, a ploy of the enemy to use to drain and to destroy it's another it's another trick of the enemy to wear out the saints and then someone that God is using mightily he'll do everything he can to destroy and over in uh, Matthew, let's look at some. I'm going to give you some on soul ties, too. I want, but I wanted to show you that you need, we need to call our souls back. My prayer is that God restore in me the soul you put in me when you created me. Over in Matthew's Gospel, in, in uh, chapter 16, I've cut out a whole lot of it. I'm just going to give a nails. Okay, I was going on the worship and praise that God wants. God wants us to worship him with all of our hearts and soul. And so, all of our heart and soul. So, the more the soul that's removed, the less you want to worship the Lord. So, this is another reason that the enemy takes and fragments the soul and takes that little bit at a time. I might get ahead of her. But she hasn't even mentioned the fact that when he takes something out, he leaves something in place of it. Go ahead. Always, he never ta- removes any portion of your soul. And he does it just like he, she explained here. And the way that she explained that he does not put a demon back in place of it, which acts for a long period of time just like it's your soul. And you don't know the difference. You can't possibly know the difference. It acts just like you. You know, demons... How many, how many people here right now, churches... Uh, teach deliverance. Let's see your hand. Okay, I've got a good group that teach deliverance. But how many more? There's not about a third of you, I would say, raised your hand. How many more? Your churches don't even talk about demons. Well, a third of Jesus' ministry, one third of it, was casting out devils. That's what he did uh, in a third of the reported ministry of Jesus. The rest was the healing and the, and the uh, teaching of the kingdom was, was the other one. And it, it, is, it is legitimate. It is real. And uh, uh, we've stuck our proverbial heads in the sand to keep from seeing what is real around about us because we don't want to acknowledge that there is something that could, could control us that we cannot we cannot handle. A demon, you're no match for a demon in the flesh. In the flesh, you're no match for a demon. You know, certainly no match for Satan. And I don't think Satan's fooling with any of us. Satan has bigger fish to fry. But he has enough demons to go around. But let me get back and let her finish. I wanted you to understand that when he removes a portion of your soul, there is a demon left there. And that demon might not operate only as a part of your soul, maybe for as much as 20 years. And then all of a sudden, he gains enough strength by receiving other demons in. You thought it was bad when, when Jesus met a demoniac and when he found out how many was in there, didn't you? He said, my name is Legion. A Roman legion was from four to 6,000. Now, that's how many, what a size a legion is. But you know, in this day and time, we have received demons over and over and over and over and over again and again and again and again. And we're, we're loaded. And they, they play here. They play in our minds. And because they do, they, they dull our senses to, to really receive the Word of God and to understand what God is telling us. And this is what this is all about. And this is why God's people have come to the place that we are today that know only a handful of churches are teaching deliverance and ta- telling you that there are demons in the world today and that you are, are a 
you are a spiritual uh, battling bunch of people. You have to go into spiritual warfare, and you're going to have to stay there. It's not a one-time deal for, for this ministry that you've come here for these days. If you don't go and keep this when you go home, you can... You just might as well not come if this is not going to serve you any any purpose when you get back home. Now, I know your your desire is to do something good when you leave here. I, I know that every time I've ever come over here, I have, I have been uh, blessed abundantly by the ministry in this place. And I have made up my mind that I'm going to be different every time. And do you know the enemy begins to work on me on the way out of here? And he's going to work on you the same way. Well, I've learned that he's not going to take it away from me. And I'm going to walk on with the Lord. And I'm going to be a, 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 a soldier in God's army. I'm going to do spiritual warfare. Recalling my soul back day by day. And I'm gaining ground. And we'd better learn to do the same. Or else he, he will overtake us because he is stronger than we are. And if we do not trust in the Lord and make effort on our part, it is, a, it is an effort on your part. You're going to have to determine to do this. You can't walk in presumption on this one now. Let me tell you, if you do, you're going to be defeated. If you say, well, God's strong enough to handle this for me, I'm going to sit back and wait for Him to take me home, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. I'm going to do deliverance until He, if, it, if he does take me, that I'm going to be throwing out devils when the day I go. I promise you that I am sick and tired of seeing what the enemy's done to people. And, you know, we want our souls saved. And we can't get it saved until we get it all back. And so, you know, the Lord, I'm, I'm going to use more scripture, but I want to show you something the Lord shared, did with me. I, we have four kids. Kids. Oldest son's 52, 51, 51. And our baby is 40-something. I can't, don't remember right at the moment. I have to look my book up. I've got, we've got nine grandkids and two great-grandkids. And, you know, uh, mothers are really prone to be concerned and worry about their kids sometimes. And they say, oh, I'm not worried. I'm just uh, anxious, you know, or so forth. And so in, in the area of, uh, it just felt like I was just being bound by them. I couldn't, uh, I'd break soul ties and I couldn't get, seem to get free from it. Even though I was breaking soul ties and I knew that I should and I was breaking evil soul ties. By the way, you can't break a good soul tie. You break evil ones. And, uh, I, I would break those soul ties and I was sitting on my couch one day. I spent a lot of time at home, uh, by myself, just the Lord and I. And uh, so I was praying, and, and uh, I said, Lord, I want to know why I'm not being able to get free from this boy of mine, 51-year-old boy. He said, um, you know, you haven't forgiven him for disappointing you. And he began to name off the things that I hadn't forgiven him for. The Spirit of the Lord put his finger on it, and I began to repent and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I, I forgive him. And, and uh, then the, the Spirit of the Lord was showing me, he said, you meditated on it so long that you formed a soul tie with it. And so you need to break that soul tie so you can turn him loose. And uh, and it was amazing to me. I don't know how long it took me to do all this because I sat there on that couch and I said, I want, he's a man of his own. I, there's nothing I can do for him. And I, I can't afford to have him stealing my time, all my thoughts and everything I've got. I, it, I couldn't even seem like study the Word because he was just constantly in my thoughts. And as I began to ask the Father to forgive me for holding unforgiveness against him, and I asked the Father to forgive me for, uh, and I, I said, Lord, I forgive him, my son, for disappointing me. He hasn't been, this is what he hasn't walked, you know, and done the things that you want your children to do. And as I did this, and I began to call my soul back from him. He was our firstborn, and, and, and he, you know, it seemed like your firstborn always has a special place. You don't love them anymore, but they're just kind of special, or at least that's the way it's been with me. And, and as I did this, I had such freedom. And I didn't just have some freedom, I still have it. And, uh, it's just, and it just amazed me what the Lord had shown me in this area. And let me tell you something, as I'm talking about this, uh, um, through evil soul ties, and and, um, and and I'm not going to be able to read all the scriptures I've got, but over in Genesis, you know, when man, God put man and woman together and they became one flesh, they literally, we literally become one flesh with them. 
uh, I learned I learned that uh, you can have an evil soul tie with your own husband, and I broke an evil soul tie. And I learned this by uh, my husband kept coming home. He works full time, and he works with a lot of people, and they were always bringing in infirmities into the plant and he seemed to pick up some of me and he didn't get them he brought them to me and I got them and I was just sick and tired of it I said Lord that's not right way and why is he bringing all this stuff into our house and the Lord began to tell me he said you break an evil soul tie with him and I never heard of an evil soul tie between a man and wife and so I broke an evil soul tie between he, he and I and I said in the name of Jesus I break that soul tie and I call my soul back out of him and and I will not receive any more of that sickness that he brought in and I have it so you see you learn as you as you seek the Lord you learn and through this people I don't think we have even scratched the surface of what God wants us to know about our soul we we think we know it and and we don't want to listen you know sometimes that I've heard that a hundred times I never I never do a study on so on the soul that I don't begin to learn something new and I learned through through soul ties that uh, down from the grandmother and the, gra- the great grandmother and the great and the mother that can I digress just a minute? I always do this anyway. So y'all forgive me, but I was going to show some on, on the sins of the mothers. Let me ask you something. Let me throw this out to you. How many of you women and men have some of the characteristics of your mother or some of the physical things that your mother had in your life, and they come through these? Evil soul ties through the sins of the mothers. And I'll tell you this. I'll share this with you. My mother was sick all of my life. And her mother was sick all of her life. And over in Ezekiel, I'll give you the scripture. Ezekiel 16, I think it's 16. It says the, the daughter is like the mother. Or the mother, yeah, the daughter is like the mother. And she's walking in the sins of the mother. And I had never seen that before, but I'll tell you what, and it's talking about, it goes, and there's some other things in it, it's talking about um, um, the, mo- the mother was a, uh, I forgot, Canaanite, one was a Canaanite, and the other was a Moabite, and Canaanite is lust, and the, uh, the father was something, it, so it's lust and pride that the, fa- the father and the mother were that came forth, and through this, through this, uh, things from the mother, if you need to go back, if you're having, say your mother had heart problems, or your grandmother had heart problems, you need to go back and break a soul tie between your mother and your grandmother from your grandmother to your mother from your mother to you and cut off that threefold cord there is a threefold cord and those curses uh, uh, come back down through the evil soul tie and that's where the sicknesses come from the characteristics come a lot of the characteristics of the mother we you know we talk, we know about the sins of the father i've taught sins of the fathers for years and we know and, and one day i was just thinking lord my kids don't act like my husband. He's, he was never sick. See, I had the same symptoms that my mother did till I, I learned how to get rid of them. And my sisters. Isn't it awful have a, somebody coaching you over here making you tell? I had had 13 major surgeries. I was sick all, in eight years. I was sick all the time. I lived on medication. That's the reason I hate sickness. God healed me, and I have... have I praise God for healing. I was on medication. They said I'd been on, be on the rest of my life. But God healed me. And I praise the Lord for it. But that was the same spirits and the same soul type thing that was coming down through my family bloodline came to me. And the last sickness she had was 1972. The Lord is faithful. He's, he, he honors. He watches over his word to perform it. He honors his word. But But I want you to know that you, when you break these soul ties, by the way, when you break, you know about soul ties and you break them, do you ever break them forward? You break them backwards. But we need to break them forwards off of our kids. We need to break them back for the same amount. It says to, uh, for the, to the third and the fourth generation. The curse of the bastard is a ten, year, ten generation curse. And incest is a ten generation curse. And we also, I, you see, we, we, we're so used to going backwards and breaking these curses and soul ties that we need to go forward and do it. And I don't want to get on curses, but I, I do want you to know that uh, if you'll start breaking soul ties between your, your uh, mother as well as your father, and I always do it this way. I break soul tie over uh, over whoever I'm praying for, over both sides of the family, back to the Garden of Eden, because you can't go any further back than that. 
that break those soul ties and ask the Father to destroy them in the name of Jesus. Okay, in, in Matthew's Gospel in the 16th chapter, in the verse 26, it says, For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for a soul? So we see that the soul can be exchanged. When you read that the first time, you, you thought, well, you know, a man just uh, gives souls, it just turns to the devil. Or he, you didn't think about giving the truth. So did you really think that a person would t- give their soul for things? That the soul could be tra- traded? Did you ever think of that before you learned that the, there is such a thing as soul ties and, and that the soul can be removed? People, the thing that I'm, I want to say is, sh- try to show you this afternoon is, if you're ministering to someone, if you're having trouble getting your children saved, or your grandchildren, or if they're on drugs, let me tell you, drugs removes the soul. Alcohol will do the same thing. Not all of it at one time, but fragment it, and it makes it harder and harder to get them to come to Jesus. And even after they they decide, well, I'm going to get saved, they have this hard time of coming, uh, uh, staying saved, and then believing they're saved or understanding the word. We went through this. I told you about it with this woman in our church, and her mother brought her in, dumped her on our doorstep one day, and said, deliver her. Praise the Lord. I said, not to deliver. Jesus is. Over in Luke chapter 12, I want to show you something else. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 16. You know, you know the parable of, of um, uh, the Good Samaritan? No, this is not that one I thought it was. This is the one that, about the rich man. And he said, um, uh, in verse 16, he said, uh, there, uh, he spake a parable to, unto them. Jesus did say, in the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful, and he, he brought within him, he thought within himself, what shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruit. And he said, this will I do, that I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruit and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods, laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thy fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things be which? Then who shall these be, things be which thou hast provided? Here we see that that the soul can go into things. Your soul can also go into your children. You can have soul ties with your children. You, you know, you know what, you know what, how you become uh, get a soul tie with your children. You put them up. And worship them. They become your God. I've got a great uh, granddaughter right now that's about to do that with her grandba- with her baby, my great one, of my great grandbabies. And I've got to get through to her. She's a little Catholic girl. She knows a little bit about deliverance, a whole lot about her grandma, her, her, her mima, as she calls me. And uh, she she loves that baby so much that she's making that baby her God. Her whole life is centered around it. And people, we're all guilty, been guilty of it. And we need to break evil soul ties with the children. Do you know you bind your children by those soul ties? You bind them, and they can't go off and be normal and live a normal life because they're bound to you. And you need to release them in, into the hands of the Lord. Break the soul tie. Call their soul. Listen, we started calling soul, t- and, and, and it never dawned on me that the soul was, and I don't know, I'm really real smart, I don't y'all know that. Because it never dawned on me if you break a soul tie and you call the soul tie out that you're removing somebody else's soul out of you. And we were breaking soul ties and calling people's soul tie out of us from the very beginning. We believe in calling them out. And the reason I did this, years ago I, I was mentioned to a little girl, Phyllis is still in here. She remember Charlotte. We were breaking soul ties with Charlotte, and uh, between members of her family, and she began to act like them. The demon, see, it's, it becomes a de- it's a demon, and the demon manifested as her mother acted just like her mother. And we, there were some others we broke, and she began. She would sound like them. She had. She would. Her face. Features would change into it to look like them, and we so we knew it was it was a spirit. So we called it sounds better to say spirit. We called the spirits out. 
and, and she is so free today. And I praise the Lord from all this stuff that, that she was, was bound up with. But this is the way we learned that you call the soul tie out. And we didn't know that at that time we needed to call back the portion of our soul that had been formed with, a, with another person. Or like with her mother, we didn't know to call it back. And over in uh, Proverbs, uh, Irma hit on some of this just upstairs this afternoon. Uh, the soul, you can form a soul tie in, if you commit adultery. In Proverbs, in the sixth chapter, in verse 32, it says, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Adultery is a sin, it's an abomination to God, and you, if, if a man or woman has sex outside of the marriage, that it is adultery, and there's a soul type formed with that individual, and it needs to be broken, and you need to call the soul of that individual out of you and to call your soul back. If you've been married before, you need to call your break a soul tie, evil soul tie with an ex-husband or an ex-wife, and call your soul back from them, and call their, get their soul called out of you. God wants us free from anything that binds us. We, God wants us to re, wants to restore our soul so that we can that we can have all of our soul to worship Him. And to praise him and to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might. And I'm about to run out of time and I've taken too long. But I want you to know this afternoon that the soul can be fragmented. It can be removed. You can form soul ties. And you can do it with animals. If you've got pets that you treat like human beings, you better break soul ties with them. Listen, God, God doesn't mind you having them. But but you sure don't need to make make uh, have form soul ties with them. You need to break it. I cast I've cast listen people. I've cast cat spirits out of people, and I've cast dog spirits out of people. Had a girl almost climb the wall one night. I didn't know even know what it was, and she was clawing at it like that. And it didn't. You know, I, you know, I told you how smart it was, and I thought, good grief, what is that? And I heard the Lord say, cat. And I said, you cat spirit, you come out of there. And she come at me like that with her, her hands like claws. And we cast that thing out. If you've got excessive cats, you you've got a soul tie. My my grand, my daughter in law had seven cats, and we had a time getting her delivered from those cats. But she doesn't have a cat anymore. So 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 Jim's gonna come forth and and come come on up. I, we're running out of time. Not anymore. Run over. And we'll pray and uh, just ask the Lord to restore our soul. Break, call your soul back, and you know, you know who you've got soul ties with. You know when He says, "I break soul ties," and and call, uh, you know who you've got them with. So you say, "I break a soul tie between me and so and so," and I call my soul back in the name of Jesus. Amen. So many things are happening that we didn't know were real, but when we walk by the Spirit of the Most High God, He begins to reveal unto us. Reveal His way and His plan, His power. But He leaves it in our hands what we do with it. And as I said before, if, if this was just for the, for the week end here, you're really not going to gain much out of it. But if you make a decision that I'm going to walk by the precepts that these preachers have preached this week, and in the deliverance area I'm going to do what the deliverance people have said to do, You'll see your life change because our life changed. We, we, we're different. We're different people. And I'll not go into that. Heavenly Father, do a work right now. You've impressed upon this people many times over the, these last few days of, of their lives and what's in their lives. And right now, Father, I call this people to repentance. Repentance from any sin that is in their life. It just once or repeated over and over again. And right now, I ask each person here, Father, to repent and to speak unto you under their breath. Just say, Father, I do repent of and name your sin that you repent of right now. Father, I ask that you teach us how to forgive. We say it with our mouth, but in our heart we hold to the unforgiveness. And we would want to truly we have voiced it, but we haven't learned how. Teach us right now how to forgive. For right now, we want to forgive every person 
that has harmed us in any way or that has hurt us in any way, or we feel that they've hurt us in, in any way. So that there is no unforgiveness in us right at this moment. So right now, I ask every person here to forgive any one that the Lord brings to memory right now, living or dead, matters not. Name them again under your breath. For you need to speak it so that the demon will not have a hold over you because as you put it out in the air, he hears it. Father, I do forgive. Now, Father, I bind the demons. I bind every demon here to this that's in the sound of my voice, and I command them to be obedient to, to the Word of God and to come out as I call their name. For, Father, you've given us the authority, and it is your authority, not mine. But you've you called us to, to call them by name. So in the name of Jesus, I command these demons to release, release these people and to come out now in Jesus' name. First of all, I want to break those soul ties. I break a soul tie over every person here with any person that you name right now. You name the person you need the soul tie broken with one at a time. I tell, hold the authority right here. And you hold authority also. You have authority. If you're a believer, you have this authority. In the name of Jesus, I break a, an evil soul tie with my mother, my father, my sisters or brothers, my boss, my people I work with, you name him, I break a soul tie with things, with events, loved ones, some that we should not have loved. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Father, I destroy every soul tie that has been spoken by every person here in the name of Jesus, and I call those soul ties out. I command you to loose this people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have no right to them any longer. We're doing a work by the word of the Lord, and you will obey. You will bow. You know that word, demon. You know the word. Come out of them. Come out. Come out in Jesus' name. Every every soul, every demon behind the soul tie of every one that has confessed a soul tie right now, in Jesus' name, I take authority over you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Loose them and let them go. Loose them and let them go. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, loose this people. Loose this people in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I call their soul back from every place that has been hidden or, re or placed in the name of Jesus. I ask you, send your angels. Send angels, Father, if they are in earthen jars, break them. If they are in... Wooden casks, break them. If they're in glass jars, break them and release the souls. As you said in Ezekiel, uh, those, those souls that had been made to fly, to return those souls, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you return the soul of everyone here in the sound of my voice to do a spiritual work right now in Jesus' name. We ask, Father, right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you complete this work, that you restore us. You said in Psalms 23 that you would restore our souls so therefore Father we had need there or you would have never spoken it and we declare that we want our souls return this to point right now at this day in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus Angels, return those souls. Come, go and bring them quickly, quickly into the people right now. Everyone who has formed a tie that has confessed it in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father. I thank you for ministering to this people. I thank you for returning that soul. Father, I ask that you break the power of unbelief over this people right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For truly, we claim to be believers, yet we are unbelieving believers because your word has been taught in such a way that we have received it as a watered down word and not as a complete and authorized word from you, Lord. So I ask that you break the power of the unbelief where we formed uh, thoughts about it that are not in alliance and in truth to your word as you wrote it and as you spoke it. So break down this unbelief and restore, restore that word within us, Father. Give us the opportunity to receive the word afresh and anew. Uh, do a work within us right now that we are we're open vessels to receive, to receive right now in Jesus' name, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do a work now, Father. 
Deliver us from the, from the unbelief that it, it has hampered us, that has kept us separated from you, Lord, of, of your complete word and of, of your completeness in our life. Work in us, Father. In the name of Jesus, we desire we desire to be a pleasing vessel unto you, Lord. We desire that you move in and you you take control of this body right now in the name of the Lord Jesus and move and have your being and your way in this body from this day forward. In the name of Jesus, we invite you in. We say, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come, come, Holy Spirit. Come into me right now. Fill me afresh and anew. Do a work within me. Do a work right now within me. Drive out that that is that as I'm willing, as I'm willing, and I've made a decision to get rid of, uh, drive it out right now. Separate it from us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do a complete work. Separate those evil spirits, those evil demons that have come in unawares in our life, that have slipped into our to our being, into our body, into our mind. I separate even the, the ones that bring... Uh, uh, Sickness and a disease upon us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, separate those, those demons from us. We're willing, Father. We're, we're, we confess the Lord Jesus Christ right now. And we, we receive His work in our lives. And for as many as are willing right now to say, Holy Spirit, you be my guide, you be my leader, I'll be an obedient vessel unto you. Father, move right in, right now, in Jesus' name, and do that work within each one of us, that we're we are vessels of, of, to be used by you. And we lay down the flesh, Father. We lay it down and say, have your way, Lord. Not my will any longer, but you. what you want is what I desire. Move, Father. Move into the lives of your people. We are a needy people, Father. We are a people in need. We need Jesus today. We need Jesus uh, and the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. We call for the person of the Holy Spirit to come uh, infiltrate this body and permeate it and, and take control and be a, a complete in us and to complete every part of this body. We ask, Father, you move by your Spirit right now. Take control. Drive out. Drive out that that we, we no longer desire. I command those demons to leave now. In the name of Jesus, I command all that the Holy Spirit is moving in where He's moving in among people. I command them to the demons to leave. Every demon. I'll not even name you. Those you don't have to have a name this day. The Holy Spirit is convicting right now. The Holy Spirit is moving upon people right now. In the name of Jesus, I command those demons to move over. Move out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We desire. Father, we desire to be a holy people. We desire to be a set-apart people. And by the same word that Jesus used when he cast out the devils, I cast you out, demons, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I command you to loose this people. Loose them so that the presence of the Lord may be real in their lives and that there'll be no no more deception and you'll not deceive God's people any longer. Move, move in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take authority over you. I take that authority over you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I thank you for setting people free. Father, I have seen with my eye that demons have moved during this little session right here. I praise you, Lord, for, for doing a spiritual warfare in this place today. I thank you, Father, for moving uh, upon those demonic forces that, that harass the, the people. And we just praise you and we give you honor. We set the, uh, set the people apart this day now for the decision that they've made in their lives to serve you. Father, we honor that decision here and we know that you have honored it and we we give you glory for touching the lives and drawing this people during this, these days here. We praise you and we thank you for the work that you're doing. And we just thank you for what you will yet do in our lives. For as we uh, walk away from this camp, Lord, we, we make a decision that you shall be Lord over our lives and that we will walk away a new person, 
a different person who is not going to be dissuaded, not going to be uh, drawn back into the net of the enemy. We praise you and we thank you. We give you glory for you're a God and you're, you're the almighty God and you're the one that loves us and has watched over us and kept us and blessed us. So we thank you. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, we bless the food. We bless those who have prepared it. We praise you for supplying the need here for this camp. We thank you, Lord, for uh, drawing people in to help, to be a blessing, to, that we may go back and have food and eat it. I set it apart for strengthening and nourishment of the body, and I just give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You are dismissed. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.